the five churches, the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Church, the Syriac Church, Armenian Church, and Indian Malabar Church. And God, for God, we are the ultimate creation. We are the, the, the top of creation for Him. We are Oriental body of the Oriental Orthodox Churches and I will dwell on this issue longer in my speech. But uh, the five churches, the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Church, the Syriac Church, Armenian Church, and Indian Malabar Church. So we pray for the, all the patriarchs and the Catholicos and the Pope of these five national churches who are, who are in history, one of the first churches, in a way, who embraced Christianity for almost 2,000 years as a body. Uh, secondly, I thank the organizer, our father here, our brother in Christ, that managed to give this responsibility to you and to me to be together today. And uh, when I was trying to listen, the uh, choir, the deacons singing. Uh, I didn't understand a single word in a way, <laughs> but the way they sang, it was so beautiful. Uh, I'm a bit familiar with Arabic music at least, so I could have stayed and listened to them uh, for hours maybe. Uh, but I could f see, feel the spirit moving as they were leading us in prayer through this hymn. Because words, music, and other ways of communications are instrument which will bring us to the spiritual uh, contact with our divine uh, Father, our God, uh, so that when we are in contact, the words, the music, and everything else would have done their mission. After that, only there is the spiritual unity between us, our soul, and eternal God himself, and that the beauty of the Christian worship. And uh, thank you for coming such a cold date to this uh, sanctuary so that we'll be together. And I agree with the, our, with the Father, our, my brother in Christ, that I hope that this will be just the beginning of uh, bringing us together as Oriental churches this doesn't mean that in other places we haven't met. We are not aliens to one another. Armenians with Egypt were known from the seventh century, even during the Crusaders as well. There was pretty large community and we had in touch, and when I say in touch, in communion, as well as many Armenians have intermarried and eventually became part of the Coptic Church. Anyhow, today I don't have a specific theme, but I've been given a couple of thoughts and ideas which I would like to share with you. Why, why first Christianity? Why we are Christians? What makes us unique among others? Particularly when we come to this country, Australia, where you meet people, Hindu, Buddhist, with the Muslims, we, at least those who are from the Middle East, they know a bit of who are the Muslims are. And then agnostics, as the majority of young people are, indifferent towards religion. Religion is not something which, it's something old, past. It's not cute, it's not cool, or whatever you can call it. So why to follow religion? Uh, these old things, you know, this, only elderly people follow religion, in particular Christian religion. Well, we as Christians, we believe that Christ our Lord came to us for us in time and in his history and became one of us 
in order to save us from our old sins, the original sin of revolting, rebelling against our parent, against our God, and for which we were punished. And sometimes I bring that example, and we mustn't forget, though language, words, are important ways of communication, God has blessed us in a unique manner that we can express our thoughts to one another, but nonetheless we know that those words sometimes are limited in their uh, possibility to express really what we feel. It doesn't matter how many volumes of book you can write, how you can express mother's love towards her children, or husband or wife's wife towards one another. So all those are then, though limited in capacity, but nonetheless, we, we don't have any other means to communicate, to express our thoughts and our feelings, but through those words which God has blessed us. So our examples likewise will be from our own human experiences. For example, when we call God the Father, why we call God the Father? The feminist today will say, let us call God the Mother. Why the Father? So in God, there is no father and mother. In God, there is eternal spirit. But simply because when Christ our Lord taught us, he prayed to the Father. That's why we learn from him then to pray to the Father without necessarily giving a, a masculine or feminine entity to his deity. His deity is beyond comprehension as such. Uh, in the Christian tradition, at least in the Orthodox Oriental churches, we believe that there's a limit how far our world can go then to explain who God is. And after a certain part, after a certain way of speaking, and that the speaking and writing can be volumes of books, there comes a time, a limit, a limitation, where we say this is how far we can go, and after that it's a matter of faith. You have to believe in, you have to feel inside, and that's what is counted eventually. So Christianity then is believing in our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that there are other religions, and we as Christians, we are tolerant, we understand that some of those religions can help people as well to walk in God's path or way. But we as Christians, we, we believe strongly that our way is the best way, is the shortest way or the longest way, the way you want to describe it, it doesn't matter, but is the best way. But the best way will be the best way or the way if we believe in it. Not only what we say is important, the most important is how we live what we say. And that's where the youth come into then uh, importance, particularly in this country. So we are, as Christians, we believe we have a mission. Our mission is to spread the Christian way of life with peaceful means to all humanity as much as possible. Every Christian one, every one of you is an apostle. Every one of you is a missionary because you are Christians. It's not only my duty to preach Christianity or our brothers in Christ here, the clergy. It's everyone who is baptized in the name of the Trinity is a preaching member of the Christian church from the day when he or she is baptized and from the day when we start to follow and come to church and to live according to the Christian principles. If our Christianity doesn't make us a better person, then it means that we are failed somehow, somewhere in our road to be good Christians. So we have to be careful when we say, I'm Christian. Nobody can say I'm Christian simply because he or she is baptized. That's not good enough. 
Christianity is not something you go and buy in the shop today and you forget about it till Easter comes or till years go by and suddenly you realize that, oh, I'm a Christian, I must go and pray. Sometimes in our industrial world, I say, God is not a shopkeeper waiting for you so that you go with a list of things you need written on it and say, God, I would like those, those, and those. I'm here for shopping. That's not the way it works. We pray to God not only when we need God. We pray God all the time. We pray God to praise Him, to thank Him. And sometimes you think that something extraordinary must happen in order to praise or to, uh, to, praise or to thank God. Every morning when you open your eyes, you're a living creature. You can thank and praise God for that day. And throughout the days of our life, we have to know how to thank Him. And if we trust in Him, and if our trust is absolute in Him, then nothing can bother us. No difficulty, no troubles will get to that. They can kill our body, but they cannot get to the soul. So that's the strength of the true believer. Yes, we might suffer. Yes, we might cry. There are times when there are times we seek help from the cross, the very cross on which Christ himself died. But we know that by dying, he gave us life and everlasting life. So we seek that life, everlasting life. The time which what we have here is a temporary. We know that. From the day we are born, we will die. And for those who don't have faith in the eternal life, I feel sorry for them. Because they live like animals, and they like die like animals. We know that the body will go to the earth because it's taken from the earth. But the soul, the eternal soul, what God has given us, that we go to eternally, we live. And thus we have to struggle in this life in order to inherit that beautiful eternal life for which Christ gave his body for us on the cross. So Christianity then is this way which we have to practice. But why we need the Christian faith, this ancient way of life in this modern society? Some people say Christian faith is 2,000 years old. It's old. Why do we have to follow that? There's a kind of a joke. Uh, missionaries, when they used to go to and uh, preach in the Amazon uh, river valleys in Brazil, they spoke about Christ to these people who never heard of Christ. And they said, we would like to see this Christ, this Jesus, this God. Where is he? And they said, well, he was here 2,000 years ago. I said, what he was, why, why he didn't visit us for 2,000 years and he's coming just now? Where he's been all this time? So in the mind of people then is all the, all the time this kind of uh, struggle, the old and the new. And that's, that's usual, it happens to us. Uh, but in this struggle, we mustn't forget that Christianity, it can be old, but it is eternal as well. So it's new all the time. Even just think about the Lord's Prayer, our Father, the one which we say almost every day and sometimes many times in a day. Our Father, which is so many words, every day we can stress one word in a unique manner. Because that day, that particular word is the center of our attention. So it's something new. The same with the Bible. You read the Bible, in particular the Gospel. We know that we think that we know the Gospel. And myself, even after so many years, after 40 years studying, learning, practicing, sometimes I open the Gospel and suddenly, wow, I see something. I say, how come? I didn't see this before. Well, I wasn't looking for it before, that's why. So there is something new all the time in the gospel message, which is an eternal message. God is eternal, 
and we are the temporary people in this world. So in that eternal message that has been renewed from generation after generation, we mustn't be afraid taking new ideas, new ways and means. There was a time when microphone wasn't there, the light wasn't there, TV wasn't there, but today we take it for granted and we use it that. We're not afraid of that. So in this manner, in the same manner, we mustn't be afraid of using modern technology and means to communicate, to pass on the good Christian tradition, the good way of life. Given that we, whenever, whatever we use it, we use it for the good purpose of all people of the body of Christ. There are times, because science is moving so fast these days, that well, as a religious people, uh, we, we, we stand of Christian faith towards issues, we're not kind of running fast enough after all these new changes. But I have very simple, a while ago, Father represent me as a theologian. I'm not a theologian. And I don't like theologians. They make prob problems most of the time. I'm a simple man. I like the simplicity. And when our Lord Jesus Christ spoke, most of the time, what he did, he told the stories, parables, beautiful, simple stories, which are so simple that everybody, the philosopher, the learned person, the simple person, everybody can understand it because there is a so solid message in it, so deep message in it. For some it's mysteries, or some is a story, but it reaches to everybody according to their level. So in the same way then, we have to be careful when we're getting, grabbing new ideas, new methods, new, new attitudes to new uh, creation of uh, scientific uh, you know, uh, uh, things, for which we must have one simple rule. Is this good for the body of Christ? Is this good for the whole church? We mustn't look what is good for me, that's not good enough. We have to look if it's good for the all humanity. We have to seek and find out if it's good for all the Christian people first and foremost. And then we can think about other people, other religions, then even the whole world. So if it's good for the whole world, for the whole creation, in that sense, then it is good for God. And it can be good for us as Christians as well to adopt. We are all then, as I was saying, preachers. What we preach? We preach Christ who has been crucified and risen. If anybody comes to you and say, I'm Christian, but I don't believe in the resurrection, or I don't believe in the Holy Trinity, well, he can be anything but not Christian. So you have to be careful with those heretics or other faiths who try to be like uh, from outside sheep and from inside wolves. So you have to be careful with these people, what they are saying and what they are doing. Because they are after only one thing, your soul. And once they grab you, and God help you then. So from the beginning you have to be clever enough because your faith has given you already enough of uh, strength of teaching that you can see what is good and what is bad. Today life is running so fast that at the age of 10, 11, if you already you don't know who you are or where you're going, it, it might be too late for you. So that's why the church, and when I say the church, I'm not the church, the priests are not the church, we all together are the church, the living church. We all together have to work on this, particularly those who are called parents. Being a parent in the Christian setup is not just to bring children. That's the important task of a parent, but to make sure, but as well as how these children are grown up, how spiritually they are safe and sound, so that when the trouble outside comes and hit us, we are like a rock who cannot be shaken from any kind of uh, floods or waters or whatever, troubles of life. 
So that's why we have to start working on our children from the day even they are born. We have to bring them to the church. We have to nurture them with the good Christian traditions, with the faith. Let them learn here the music, the hymns of the church. Let them hear from the very, even when they don't understand the stories of Jesus, because gradually it will sink into their mind, into their souls, into their hearts, and they will understand what those stories are, are all about. It is difficult to be a Christian, but on the other hand, to be a Christian is not simply a weak. Sometimes people say that, particularly for us Armenians, ah, if we weren't Christian, we would have been a strong nation. I don't believe in it. Christianity has inner strength. The simple thing is to know that the strength, to understand where you can get strength, obviously from the Lord himself. If you can have the power, as St. Paul said, have the, uh, the, the weapons and all what it comes with it to defend yourself, the shield, the spear, the, the, the weapons, whatever, uh, those are all examples, obviously, uh, taken from uh, armies, for example. But we are fighters as well. We are fighters, we are soldiers, we are the army of Christ against evil. And evil is there all the time. But evil will not exist on its own. Sometimes we give the example of light and darkness. All these lights, if you turn off, there is darkness here. But immediately when there is light, there is no darkness. So darkness does not exist on its own. Darkness is the result of being no light over there. So when we are light of the world, or when we have the light of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts, there can be no darkness. The two cannot coexist together in the same place, in the same time. So if you are the light, if you are the soldiers of the light, then darkness will run away, will shun from you, because you know what you believe in and you know how you live your own life. Most important thing on which I will try to dwell a bit, when we are in Western world, and I regard Australia as Western world, because it's based on British, Western, American civilization or way of life. And we think we the Oriental people by birth and sometimes by fate, because some of you probably have been born here, so you think you're, you're, you're westernized, you think you are Australian. So what you have to do with the Middle East and the Middle Eastern way of thinking and mentality. And we sometimes even rebel against that, particularly against our parents. Your ways are the old ways of the old country. It doesn't work here, so let us enjoy our freedom, our way of life here. Well, your parents, are the product of a generation and of generations since the time of Christ. So we in the Middle East, not only we accepted the Christian light from the apostles, all of us, our forefathers I mean, but we not only accepted it, but we lived it for all these 2,000 years almost. Not only we lived that religion, but as well as we defended it against all things, giving martyrdom even today. So that makes us totally different from other churches. Just to give you one example, when Constantine the Great, uh, through the Edict of Milan, uh, declared Christianity as a state religion within the Roman Empire, most of the atrocities or uh, killings, massacres were stopped against the Christians. There was no persecution anymore, most of it. But at least this was within the Roman Empire. But that didn't last long. And for us as Armenians, for example, we had to put up with the Iranians who, are, who were at the time fire worshippers, Zoroastrians, and we had to defend our faith with our lives, with our martyrs and sacrifices. 
and we turned on and on till we didn't give up. They gave up their own religion. The Iranians this time became Muslims. Most of the Middle East, unfortunately, became lost for the Christians as, as, as countries because of internal affairs with, among Christians. And I would think that's the, uh, because of the instrument of evil which penetrated into the hearts of Christians, starting persecuting one another till the Islam came. And they even got all these places of Middle East. Just think about it for a second. Whole North Africa was Christian before the arrival of the Arabs in 630s or whatever. And all the Middle East, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, Armenia, most of it Byzantine Empire uh, to the western part. So all that was Christian. We lost the absolute majority of those countries and lands. But nonetheless, there were remnants and a strong uh, Christianity which remained. And those Christians, starting from Egypt, because the Copts, don't forget the input of the Coptic Church in the Christendom world in general, in its theology, in its interpretation of the Bible through the Alexandrian school, magnificent holy fathers, which are the holy fathers of the whole church. Everybody except them. The Catholics, the Orthodox, everybody who understands what our faith is all about. So they sacrificed. And when the Arabs came, these Coptic people, they fought all these centuries. Even today, they give martyrs. And don't forget, any church which gives martyrs for its faith, it means that that church is a live church. That church is not dead. Today, most of European churches are dead, whatever they are, because they don't live their faith. Most of their churches, you go, they sell the churches, they make them temples, they make them mosques, they don't care about it. That's what Christianity is in Central Europe, in England, and so forth. So you're here now in this country as young Australians. So what is important for you to keep these traditions? I believe that what Jesus said, you are the salt of the world. So. We have a mission then, even in this country. If we think for the well-being of this country, financially what we do, we pay our taxes. Why we pay taxes? The expectation, sometimes it doesn't work, that's another issue. The expectation is that the taxes what we give, the government will be using for good purposes. Roads, uh, uh, health insurance, and so, so many, many other things, anyhow. So we, as citizens of this country, then we pay. We are worried about the well-being, the physical well-being of this country, so we give, because it's the law. What about the spiritual well-being of this country? We see that how far this country, this last 50, 60 years, has shifted from Christian roots to agnosticism, indifference, accepting all religions, Sometimes people come, well, we can mix all these religions and Christianity, one of them, we can pick as if you're going to a, a shop and you're buying a bit of orange, a bit of uh, apple, a bit of plum, whatever you want, and bring home and eat uh, together or whatever. This is not a salata, you see. <laughs> We're not cooking here, uh, mishmash. Uh, nobody can do that. I mean, that will not be the religion for which our forefathers died. They gave their lives. Our life is a Christian way of life. And that's what we, the uniqueness of Christian faith, as I said, is that Christ died on the cross and he rose from the cross. If Christ just died, was, uh, died, died on the cross, just he died, was dead on the cross, that would have been the end, end of the Christian faith. There were many people who died on the cross. And for good reasons sometimes, like Spartacus, for example, who fought against the Romans and wanted to liberate the slaves. But nobody worshipped him as God, though it was a very good cause. But because Christ died and 
rose again from the dead. That's what made the Christian a unique religion. And that's what we have to believe in. You can try to express this in words. I don't think it will work because as most of us, we like uh, Thomas, that we don't believe in it unless we see with our own eyes and we touch it with our own hands as if, as if we are the litmus paper to check it, to make it sure that we can decide what is right, what is wrong. Well, the door will close, as all you know, and suddenly Jesus appeared. Well, if suddenly Jesus appeared when the doors and the windows were closed, then according to our scientific means, it must be a phantom appearance to the eye, which sometimes happens. You think that you're seeing something, but it appears to you. But what Jesus said to Thomas, come and touch me. So the two together, suddenly appearing, disappearing, and suddenly physically being there. So this does not follow the rules and the regulation of the scientific world the way we know it. But that doesn't mean that it happened, because it's the witness. And let's not forget, it's a testimony and the witness of first oral tradition that the message of Jesus was proclaimed and passed from one generation to the other. The gospel was written later. First, it was an oral tradition, oral experience. And as we know, not everything was written in the gospel. But the church, the first Christians, preserve some of those traditions, like worshiping, making the sign of the cross and so forth, or the veneration of the Blessed Virgin Mary. All those come from the early Christian traditions. We didn't create them. We simply received from previous generations. So it was passed from one generation to the other. So, we are here in Australia, so we are called to be the salt, in the sense, the, the true Christianity in this world. For me, this is a most important challenge. Why? Because Jesus in the Gospel said, for the second coming. The second coming is one of the fundamental teachings of the Christian Church. We believe in the second coming. And the second coming will be a glorious coming if Jesus came and saw Christians following his footsteps. And we can bring examples from the Old Testament. When the flood happened, only Noah was saved. The remnant, the issue of the remnant. So God will forgive even if there is a one remnant, one family. Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot was saved. The whole cities were destroyed. But because of him, there was a continuation now. So we are supposed to be the salt. We are supposed to be the ones who will preserve the Christian good traditions in this world so that the second coming will be a victorious coming. If we don't keep it, it will be judgment. It is a total destruction. Sometimes we say God is patient. Yes, God is patient, Com comparing our patience or our time. But sometimes there is that last drop, whatever that last drop is, and whenever it happens, then catastrophe will happen. Catastrophe will happen if we didn't or we haven't done our duty and responsibility for our children, for our grandchildren, for this country and for the world. So it's a challenge for us as Christian youth then to embrace the Christian faith in such a manner that will be the good children, the good ones will persevere all the temptations, all the temptations. Because those, sometimes we think Satan, ugly person or with tail or ears or whatever. Satan is not these days. Satan comes to you in a very beautiful manner, easing. For example, one Sunday you would like to go to church. I'm, I'm tired a bit. I don't want to go to church. 
another day, it's raining. I like the warmth of the bed. I stay in bed. Another day is sunshine. Oh, I go to the beach, you know. Why not? You know, enjoy my life. So when, when, when you're going to pray for God, for all the gifts, what God has given you freely. You see the point? The Satan comes to you in all the good manners. So that tempts you, takes away you from the church. We know that we can pray separately, wherever we are. God is all, everywhere. But as a body of Christ, when we come to the Holy Liturgy to receive the sacrament, we come as one body. The beauty is there that our prayers are linked together. There, the priest, the celebrant priest, the praying priest, are only one part of the, of the celebration of, of divine liturgy. The choir comes into it on behalf of the people. The deacons come on behalf of the people. So we are all united together in such a manner that even time ceases to be. I know we are Oriental as well. Sometimes people say, your divine liturgy is too long. Too long. What is too long? What is too short? It's very relative what is long and short. If you go to a movie, do you say this movie is two or three hours? I, will, I would like to see only the ending. You don't go like that. Or if you go to watch a football or soccer, whatever sport you want, you don't say, I'm not going to stay three hours and watch this thing. If you like it, if you love it, you will. What about our own then spiritual welfare? You see? Because coming together, praying together, that's such a beautiful experience. Heaven, we are, our souls are lifted into heaven. As I was saying a while ago, during the divine liturgy, yes, the deacons sing, the priest sing, says words, the incense, the pictures, the painting, holy paint, all that play their role. But they roll to a certain limit, certain way on your spiritual journey. Once you get to a place where your heart meets God, you are in heaven. It doesn't matter how long it goes, the liturgy. You don't feel the time. But in order to have that kind of feeling, you must enjoy the divine liturgy. You must feel that experience of joyous experience, of praying together. And in that togetherness, there is no time, as I said. Because when God is there, there is no past, there is no present, there is no future. There is just the feeling of God, eternal God, in our hearts. How beautiful it is. And sometimes we have in our prayers that experience is not given even to the angels. Just think about it. We, as mortals, it's been given to us. We, among all other creatures, everything else, God is our parents. And God, for God, we are the ultimate creation. We are the, the, the top of creation for him. That's why we, he cares for us. That's why we matter for him. You are parents, some of you. And you know how much you love your children. And sometimes there are times when you say no to your children. And sometimes even you can touch the ear. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm against those who say that the parents have no right to give a slap to the child. They don't understand what, how to raise a child, that means. Because as a parents, there are times we have to say no to our children. Because they don't know what is good or bad for them. They don't know. They are children. They, any time they would like, let's say, to eat something sweet. And if you don't care about your child, you give all the time whenever he wants that sweet, he will be obese, he will have diabetics, and he will die early. Is that kind of child you would like to raise? No. So because we love the child in question, that's because it's part of our creation with God. And that's why we care for him or her. And that's why then we will say no sometimes what is evil, what is not for his or her uh, physical as well as spiritual well-being. 
If we human being we care for ourselves, how much more our eternal Father? In our religion, it's so beautiful Christianity that God became one of us. Just think about it. Even that thought itself, utmost humility and total sacrifice, which only a true loving parent can do. God loves so much for us that He sacrificed His only Son for us on the cross. And those of you who've seen some of those films, the, the one of the crucifixion. Sometimes we say the prayer without uh, really uh, understanding what it means that Jesus was crucified for us. It's not just a word you say and pass by. Crucifixion, the hammer and the nail and the, 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 the way it was hammered on the cross, you see, you feel the pain, the agony on the face, all that play its role then. When we say, you gave your body, your, your, your blood for us. God did his work through Christ for ourselves. What we do for him today, it's up to us. As I was saying, as young people, yes, you are baptized, the majority of you are baptized in the church. But that's only for you a passport, a visa. You can use it or you don't use it, it's up to you. But in order to use it that, you have to be a good Christian, not only through coming to church, and sometimes once a while, that doesn't make us. Even if you come every Sunday sometimes to church, that doesn't make you a good Christian. If you don't live and practice according to what you are learning and what you are saying. So for youth then, for me, for, for you to think about, because this is the land where you're going to stay. Sometimes I tell my people, unless you are a good swimmer, there's no place to go away from Australia unless you start swimming thousands of miles. So if you're here, you're stuck here. You're here to stay. So you're here to stay in this country. Learn the language of this country. Learn the laws of this country. Learn how to behave as Christians in this country. And don't forget to bring your input into this country for yourself, for your children, and for your grandchildren. And it's for the benefit of this country. As I said, Christianity is a good way of religion. It's a good way of life, which, which, which is based on love, on love, rather than killing and sword and this and that. We don't go around beheading people in the name of religion, in the name of God. But what we do, we love our neighbor. We sacrifice even ourselves for, ours, uh, for our people. So we have to then have our input into this society. Unless we are the salt of this society, this society, the way it is going, is going down the drain. I'm sorry, Australia is a very beautiful country in this short time what I've seen. It has nice people, but morally, spiritually, it's going down and rapidly down. And it's, I don't think it will be a long time when uh, issues like gay marriages and these things like that will be acceptable, which is against Christian religion, Christian faith. I have sympathy for those who feel like that, but Christian faith has no place for them. They cannot act the way they are acting and to impose upon us their minority. We are majority. And God has created us to be men and women. Men and women coming together for creation. For creation. So men and women, Men and men, women and women, they, don't, they cannot have babies, as simple as that. If somebody, and sometimes happens, abnormalities of society, if it's born with one eye or broken or one hand or whatever, this person doesn't go around and say, hey, look, I'm like this, so you have to do this or that for me and so forth. We feel sorry for her or him and we try to help the person in question. 
but we don't accept his reality as the normal way. He is the exception. He is the one beyond the law, in a way, of the nature itself. So I think if this government, and that's what I'm worried about, we, the bishops of Oriental bishops, even with the Catholics, we have written a letter to the prime minister. I don't know how much that will have weight, but just think about it. If a Catholic nation or a country like Ireland has accepted it, part of its government uh, law or whatever, so it's a matter of time when this will pass here. Why, why, why I'm worried about it? The reason why I'm worried about it, because they will start teaching in the schools, in the school, to the children, that this is a normal way of life, to have two fathers or two mothers, and then these children would not understand what the family is about. So we have challenges ahead of us, and we as Christians, without saying anything bad about those people, but we have to stick to our guns. There are times when we have to say the truth as it is in the Bible, in the gospel tradition. Either we are Christians or we are not Christians. I cannot accept part of the gospel and throw the rest of the gospel or the Old Testament away according to the whims of my wishes. It doesn't work like that. Either we take it or we don't take it. If we are Christians, then St. Paul says that those people will not inherit heaven, the eternal way of life. I'm not saying it, St. Paul is saying it. If it was wrong for 2,000 years, the church mustn't have kept that in the gospel tradition, in the Bible itself. And still, I'm not referring to the Old Testament example. So there are very important issues which will affect you as young people, your way of life. Because science is moving so fast. But again, my exhortation to you will be, without going into very details of theological issues, sometimes I don't understand the matter. So my exhortation, if it's, if it's truly good for the body of Christ to accept this or that way of life, to bring into our way of life this or that, So we have challenges, and you as young people, you have to think about those things, and with the clergy together, because we are family as such, and we have to try to find answers for these questions. Thank you for your time, and thank you for being here.